Wow, my conversation with Rene Elliott, co-founder of Planet Organic and Beluga Bean has blown me away. I think you need to definitely take a deep breath, get a lovely cup of herbal tea, put a candle on before you listen to this, because not only is she a woman who just blazed a trail in the organic food sector, went up against the huge supermarkets, but she is also someone with deep wisdom, learnt wisdom, and she has shared things that I've never heard before, but utterly resonated to my very core. She is incredibly special in business. And actually, I'd say for us women, she brings and yields this calmness that actually I think might change my life forever. It's one to definitely listen to, scribble down notes, read them over and over. And as she would say, whatever's happening in your life, it's going to be okay. Thank you, Rene. Bow your head and let your eyelids close on down. Where we're going, you won't need to bring your frown. I'm Holly Tucker and welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Back in 2006, I founded Not On The High Street for my kitchen table. And since then, I've gone on to launch Holly & Co. I'm the UK ambassador of creative small businesses. And I believe that having a business doing what you love is the key to a happy, fulfilled life. My dream is to help everybody start theirs. I'm here to offer advice, inspiration, wisdom and encouragement. And in my view, the best way to do this is by sharing stories. So I've reached out to my favourite small businesses, entrepreneurs and those who simply inspire me and ask them to share theirs. With thanks to Adobe, who've helped bring this podcast to life. Here are my conversations of inspiration. Hi, Renee. It is such a pleasure to introduce you on my podcast, Conversations of Inspiration. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. It's just, you have been, well, the listeners will remember I have this thing called a podcast pot, which is basically little pictures of people that I cut out and I stick them on the wall. And you have been such, your your corners of your piece of paper all turned because you've been on that wall for so long. I've always wanted to interview you. So this is a dream come true. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. So I wanted to go back. We always start right at the beginning, childhood yeah. and early influences. So you're an all-American woman born in Mississippi and raised in a small town in Massachusetts. And you were the youngest child of four people. And I read that your mum was an incredible cook, made everything from scratch. And we always like to look at these golden threads mm. in our stories. And that your dad was always encouraging you to plant and weed and pick your own vegetables. So I'm thinking that food was an important, happy part of your childhood. Yes, you've just told my story. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I'm sure there's more to it. (laughs) Yes, it was food. But the interesting thing, and it's funny because you do look back and you look back because you're asked interesting and good questions in interviews. And food was important because my mom really, though, only focused on taste. I mean, she didn't buy Mm. junk. We didn't, we weren't allowed a lot of junk food. We'd have little things occasionally, but it was home cooked food, home baked. She was an incredible baker and cook, but it was all about taste. And as I got older, I realized "Mm, there's more than taste. There's also nutrition and there's good ingredients and there's organic. So that started me on a journey. But also, yes, my dad, you know, we weren't farmers by any means, but we had a 30 foot by 30 foot square vegetable garden. And he basically made us do all the work. So, so we had to, so I, you know, I like his style. I know how to grow stuff. And, and I, I've started growing again in the last few years because we moved out of London. And it's so sweet that I remember dad taught me this, you know, I know how to do this because dad taught me this. And although I may have hated it at the time or not liked it. I'm so grateful now. And it it makes me feel close to him. So that's a lovely thing. 
Gosh, that's lovely. It sounds like it was a happy and healthy household. And you were an ambitious child, I also saw (laughs) when I was researching you for this podcast, striving to reach the top. And you were the kid at school that was dubbed most likely to (laughs) succeed. I mean, I don't know if they put a badge on you or something, but where do you think that drive came? Do you have a trophy? I, I, I thought this did sound as if it had been stamped on something. Where do you think this early drive came from? And was this like literally from a young age, like little, little? I, it's such a good question and I'm not completely sure. But what did happen is I was the youngest of four very smart kids. So, and we were in a small town. My graduating class, I think was 110. And, but by the time I got to school, they were saying, oh, you're Jan's youngest sister. Oh, you're David's sister. Oh, you're Lauren's sister. And they had, you know, my sister was valedictorian. My brother was salutatorian. So they're like high expectations. But I also believed that, I think what really showed me well through school is I thought that you were supposed to understand everything because I thought learning was sequential. So I thought if I'm sitting in class and I don't understand, I either have to figure it out or I have to stay after and ask the teacher because that I'll just fall behind. So I always made sure I understood everything, which now I realize is a brilliant way to learn. But it was just something, it was a notion that I had from being a kid. And I wasn't competitive with my, I don't remember being competitive with my classmates, but I, you know, like a lot of girls, I was a good girl and I Mm -hmm. behaved and I did well and I was very innocent and I thought the world was a gentle, lovely place and I played my sweet part in that. Of course, that all changed when I went to university. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about what changed. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I went to university and I did, I didn't know what to do. You know, this is the theme of my life. I didn't know what to do. My sibs had all gone to uni for a career you know, nursing, engineering. I was like, I don't know. And the problem was because I did well in everything. I was a straight A student in high school. It wasn't like I was shining in a particular area and I loved learning. So I loved everything. So my dad said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. So (laughs) I ended up as an English major (laughs) with a minor in Spanish because I'd studied Spanish in high school and loved it and a minor in health. And in health, the first course I did was intro to gerontology. And that was about the study of aging and illness. And I thought, wow, a lot of this stuff that seems to hit you out of the blue in your 50s, 60s, 70s actually starts when you're a child. Oh my goodness. And I started to draw the link between eating, taking care of yourself and aging well, that you know, the saying, some people say, do you know that what you, what you eat affects how you are? You know, what you eat, what you put in your mouth is, has an impact. And I'm like, yeah, no, no shit. You know, what else does your body have to work with? I mean, that was obvious to me from the beginning and doing this course, this course really solidified that. But the other thing was I read a book and I don't know if this was part of the course. I think it must've been called Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Moore LePay. And that talked about the meat industry in America, which I had no idea how the animals were treated, how the land was Mm. treated, how awful it was. And as a naive, trusting, innocent 19-year-old, which a lot of us are, I was horrified. And that was pivotal for me. And that's when I traced back when this started. It started then because I realized that no one was looking after my best interests. I couldn't trust the government and I don't to this day, to look after my best interest, to do the right thing, to treat the earth, the cow, myself in the best way possible. Those The decisions weren't made for my health. They were made for commercial reasons, all kinds of reasons, you know, political reasons. So when I read that, that was like getting hit in the forehead with a fastball. And I thought, wow, yeah. no one's looking after myself. I have to look after myself. And I have to make my own decisions and do my own research. And that's that was so powerful for me that I stopped eating meat. I could no longer see meat as a healthy food. And organic meat wasn't on the table then. So I became a vegetarian no. at 19, much to my mother's chagrin. <laughs> 
It's so interesting you talk about that book because I know there's another book that really affected you, the one written by Anita Roddick, How to Succeed in Business and Change the World. Um, I have to admit, I haven't read it and she's an all-time hero. So I don't actually understand how I've not read it. Yeah. Tell me about that because if I had that dinner table, you know, when they say, what yes. are the five people? She yeah, is a hundred percent one of my oh. people, always has been. So what was the impact of that book? So when I decided to start a business, which was when I was 28, it took me a while to figure it out. Then it was, well, what is the business and what kind of business? So it was values in terms of when I decided organic supermarket, what we sold, the product standard really, the aspirational values in terms of recyclability, refrigeration, plastic counters and such like that. But then her book informed how I wanted to think about the values in our being, our modus operandi, as I call it, our being while we were doing. So the values that ran through how we did business, who we were. And that book was pivotal for that. So I thought, okay, it's not just selling food. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's promoting health in the community, which is our mission, but it was also how we did business. And one of the interesting tenets that came out of that was something that I've developed that I teach now in mentoring called the sacred triangle of relationships, which is trust, respect, and good communication. And that started with this notion of a business based in respect, because organic respects mm -hmm. the soil, the plant, the animal, the person. And I thought, well, if we're respecting that and we're respecting the farmers and paying them a fair price and respecting our customers, then it's it's all our relationships. It's all our important relationships. So it became about how we did business internally and externally. And what's interesting now is when B Corp started up, I have clients who are going through that process. And I thought, oh, gosh, it's all the things I did at Planet that just made sense to me because they were the right thing to do, not because it was good marketing or anything like yeah. that. I just Gap knew in, in the my market. heart. Yes. Yeah, it was. And I also wanted to lead a business that was very firmly female led, that was mm. in the heart, not just in the head and do business in a feminine way because, and that was informed by Anita and uh, I did meet her for lunch around that time and seeing her success as a very lovely, sweet, powerful woman, but also by my mom, who, when I was setting Planet Up, my mom said, are you worried about being in a man's world, being having to be manly or masculine or whatever that means? And I said, yeah, probably. And she said, be feminine, be a woman. She said, that is your strength. Gosh, what a wise woman. Yeah. What, what, not easy, lucky though. Me. Not easy. <laughs> yeah, lucky, lucky you. If I take you back, though, so after your university, you went for a period of time, didn't you, to travel. You completed this degree in health and you travelled through Europe during the summer. You met your future husband in London. And before returning to Boston, where you had this light bulb moment, just take us back, because I'm going to sort of talk to you about the start of Planet Organic. Take me back to the sort of, you've got this idea, have you? Is it because you've seen it somewhere mm. else and realised that the yeah. UK just had nothing? Yes. So I have to say, before I forget, today is my 32 wedding anniversary with my husband, Brian. And because you mentioned him and we met 37 years ago on a night bus in London. So that's why I'm here. Oh. <laughs> that's why I'm How romantic. in England. <laughs> yeah, but it's our anniversary today. So what had happened was I, I did other work. I became a professional wine taster, which was really fun. I was a wine writer because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then in 1990... Brian and I went to America to do a six month, six months program of personal development and self-awareness. And that changed my life. That was transformational. And it was there. I knew that when I went to America, I would not come back and go back into the wine trade. I said to Brian, I'm 28. 
I'm going to come back and start my career, whatever that is. <laughs> and <laughs> on this course, and through working, I worked from 21 to 28 in England, I realized that I had to do something I loved that had meaning, that was that was on purpose for me. It was then what was my purpose. And two, that I hate being told what to do. So I probably mm -hmm. needed to start my own business. And I didn't have fears yep. about that. I think I was fairly naive. So when we were in America, that was in my mind while we were doing this course. And I was shopping at a spectacular health food store that had treatment rooms and food to go and tables and chairs, which I'd never seen in England or in America. So that started to turn in my mind. And I thought, I could do that. No one's doing that in England. And then before we went back, so we did the six-month program and went back. Before we did that, my sister said, if you're thinking of opening a supermarket or a health food store, come and see the, the new stores in Boston. And there was a shop called Bread and Circus that was an organic supermarket, 30,000 square feet. And wow. I just, I walked up and down the aisles and when I got to the end of the store, I turned to Brian and I said, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And I knew it. I knew for the first time in my life, I thought I'm in the right place doing the right thing. I'm on purpose. And the purpose for me was taking care of self, promoting health in the community, providing people with the best quality food, which wasn't, you know, there were great health food stores, but the supermarkets sell a lot of rubbish because of this notion of, it's not mm -hmm. about your health. They're not selling, they're not concerned about your health, neither is the government. So, which is, came from this book I read when I was 19. So I was taking that idea and putting it into practice. And I love how you summarized it saying, basically, it was looking at doing what Anita Roddick had done for the beauty industry, that you were going to do this for food. And we have to almost take ourselves back, don't we? Because it's not how we live today. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I'd love to talk to you about whether you think anything's actually changed in terms of supermarkets caring or governments caring. But it was the very early 90s. And this was a very different way of living. It was just almost like, um, oh, that's what other people do, rather than actually that we should all be eating organic. Yeah. You came to this country and thought, right, I'm going to set this up. What was the atmosphere like? What was the environment like? Did you feel like a fish out of water? Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, were people, when you told your friends, yeah. were they like, mm, I don't think so? Yeah, that's a really good question. Nobody's ever asked me that because I am American and I consider Americans to be kind of childlike in their enthusiasm and optimism. And I am an optimistic person. You know, I was born that way. I think we come into the world with a character. So I did know it may not work. You know, I thought it may fail. But I also knew that I couldn't not try. I wasn't going to not do it mm. for fear of failure. I thought I'll never live with myself. I'm only 30. And I thought if I fail, I'll do something else. But I have to try. So I was completely determined. And I have this saying that fear is excitement without breathing. So whenever I felt afraid, and we learned that in this development course, I would just breathe through it. But I would tell my friends, I would talk to people, I talked to taxi drivers, I talked to people in the queue for the tube or something. And some people would say to me, oh gosh, you're not going to do that, are you? You're not going to open a supermarket. The supermarkets will kill you. And if they don't, the banks will pull the rug out from under mm. your feet. And I got so cross. I, I was so angry at one guy. And what it did is I've always been a bit careful about who I spend time with. You know, I, I don't have negative complaining people in my life. But if there were any left at that time, they were out. That was it. <laughs> because <laughs> I, thought, was it. That was... I thought that's not helping me. And, and if it fails, they're going to be saying, I told you so. And I'll slap them. So I thought, best get rid of them now. You know, <laughs> I didn't need that <laughs> Before energy. any violence breaks out. <laughs> <laughs> would you say that that's, I just, before I carry on, would you say that's an important thing for us to think about, especially us women? Because I think I left negativity people in my lives for too long. And actually, and we're going to talk about this during the second half of the interview about being a woman in business mm. and, you know, what we contend with. 
But actually, on recent years, I've really cleared out the cupboards, so to speak, you know, and I've it's I found it to be incredibly fantastic for not only myself, but for my business, because there isn't any spare change of energy, is there really when you start? So just touch on that, because it is something very important to almost help listeners understand. About having that in your life. Well, the thing is, and I've hit this at other points in my life. I had a friend one time who we'd get together and I was always so excited to see her and she'd talk about big things that were wrong in the world. You know, not just I'm struggling with my mother. It was like huge political issues. And I said to her, and this was just something I feel very strongly. I hadn't really thought about it. I said, look, if you feel that strongly about it, get out there and do something. But don't moan because it's boring and it's depressing. So we're not friends anymore. (laughs) (laughs) It's a little too blunt for her. She was English. But I really feel that. I think I, you know, you can complain all day, every day about everything. But the world is as it is. And the only thing you can manage is your response to it and how you feel about Mm. it. You can manage yourself. So it's a drain and it's a drag. It is really quite boring. And I think, well, look on the bright side. What are you going to do about it? And I picked something that I felt very angry about, Mm -hmm. conventional farming. And I put energy into offering an alternative. And I worked with the Soil Association, you know, supporting them in the organic movement. But that's powerful. Otherwise, you know, you have one life. You have one life, one precious life to live on this earth. Are you going to really spend it moaning? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So for anyone who's got a load of moaners around you... (laughs) Say goodbye. (laughs) Renee's going to, yeah, don't get violent. Don't get to that point. Just cut them out. I'm right in saying that uh, when you started this all, and this is empowerment to everybody here who might be thinking of something, but they have no expertise in it at all. When I started Not in the High Street, I was not a retailer. Uh, I was not a tech woman. Um, You had no experience at all. And actually nobody really understood organic food at the time. But you began to learn about the industry. And I read that you were completely self-taught. And I love how you almost went back to basics, earning £3.50 an hour. Um, (laughs) Is that right? Ouch. Yes, I did. Yes. Tell me about that beginning start and having the courage to just go, okay, I'm just going to learn it. Well, we came back from the six-month program and I said to Brian, okay, I'm going to open a chain of organic supermarkets. But... I don't know anything about retail. I don't know anything about organic. I don't know anything about running a business. So I said, I'm going to get a job in the best health food store in the country, which at the time was Wild Oats on West Brom Grove. So I went to him. I went to the owner and I told him, I said, I'm going to open a chain of health food organic supermarkets, um, but I need experience. You know, I wasn't hiding the fact, I wasn't trying to secretly Mm -hmm. take information and um, and he said, okay. He said, well, do you know about, have you worked in retail? I said, no. He said, do you know about health food? And I said, well, a bit. Do you know about organic? No, that I didn't know what that was. Do you know how to be a manager or work with people? And I said, well, not really, but I've just done this personal development course. <laughs> so he said, okay. He said, my manager's leaving to go to back to New Zealand. And I said, oh, could I do that? And he said, well, not after what you just said. He said, but I'll come down on the shop floor and run the store for three months. You shadow me and we'll see what you do. So three months later, I was made store manager. And I managed that store for two years. And then I thought I was going to be turning 30. And I thought it's time. It's time to go. And you opened your first store, didn't you, in London in 1995. Yes. And also when I was at Wild Oats, I did the National Association of Health Stores course. So I learned, I read the Mm. trade magazines religiously. I got experts in to talk to the team where we were selling the product. So yes, that was my self-taught, but I was so fascinated and I would read everything and anything about food Mm. and nutrition and diet and nutrients. Yeah, absolutely fascinated. 
we're going to talk about opening and what happened in those first few years. It's just a beautiful story. But I think we talk about it. I talk a lot about it. But what I love about hearing your story is it's you became a complete nerd of your vision, right? (laughs) That is basically it's what we become the expert in the thing that you're interested in. And actually, we've got to have this passion almost, I think I read you said that you almost wanted this so badly, it you ached in your stomach yeah, for yeah. it. Because it was fully you, everything that you were, this is what you were going to do. And I think some people do ask, you know, how do you do it? And I feel like saying, well, actually, if you could get yourself into that state about something you care about, it makes the whole thing a whole lot easier, right? And actually your business is probably going to be successful because of that powerhouse that you become. Mm. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. But it's the other part to that is self-belief. Mm. And the truth is you can do anything. I believe that anything is possible and people need to take that on board. They need to trust themselves and know that everything they want to be is already within them and to trust that and move ahead as if that is true. And if you can't quite believe it, fake it until you make it because you're never going to know while you're sitting there in your head deliberating, nothing's happening. So I always say lean in, start the business because I mentor entrepreneurs, start the business and you'll either start running, you know, you start walking tentatively, you'll either start running and be completely committed to it, or you'll think, okay, yes, but not that, something different. Or you'll say, this isn't for me. I want to go work in a big corporation. It doesn't matter what the result is. The important thing is to get out of your head and into action. Yeah. Movement, moving forward movement. All, the time. all the time. And so you move forward. That's what you did. And within a year of the business running, it started to take off and awareness of organic food was starting to take off because there wasn't anything anywhere else to buy it. What was that first year like? And what were some of the challenges that you were facing? Because let's remember everybody that organic food was not it wasn't <laughs> wasn't the, the done thing yeah. right it wasn't, it wasn't. and if you were even thinking it was organic you just thought it was vegetables yes you know so i'd love to hear about that sort of new take that you gave this area yes so we were doing a couple of things one it was a one stop shop so it was 5000 square feet trolley shopping everything you would buy. So it was your full shop. It wasn't, I'll get a few things at the health food store and then go to Waitrose. It was, I'm buying everything here. The other thing was people didn't know the brands. So if you walked into a Planet Organic then, you wouldn't recognize any brand. And that was, so it felt like a private club. So that was tricky. And the third thing was, although we started appealing to what I I would say your first customer is the low-hanging fruit, It was hippies and vegetarians and vegans. My mission was to take organic mainstream. So we had to broaden that out. And then it was, how do we do that? Now, this was before the internet. Yes. (laughs) People are like, oh, what did you do on social? Uh, We had A boards outside. We had placards on the tables. We had signs, chalkboards around the shop. There was no social media. I say that to my kids and they say, you open planet in the olden days? And I'd say, well, not like Little House on the Prairie olden days. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The telephone had been invented by then. Email was just starting. (laughs) I mean, it was, it feels like that feels so long ago. So we were doing many different things and people didn't know what organic was. So there was a huge educational program to launch, which we did through leaflets and all kinds of things. But we thought we'd open the doors and people would flood in. You know, we thought, this is this makes so much sense. It's great. I knew that there would be people out there like me who wanted that, and they didn't. And the first, we opened on November 5th, and it was awful. And then December was awful. And I actually thought we were going down because by December, I was hit with the final contractor's bill, and we were having trouble paying the staff. So we got extended credit from the industry who were and have always been amazingly supportive. It's a beautiful industry to work in. And then we hired a PR company who started in January. 
And what happened was that February, the first BSE scare hit. And although I was vegetarian, we had a full service organic British Soil Association meat counter and the meat took off. Right. Because people were looking for an alternative. So yeah. there was the meat scare. And then later that year, it was when Edwina Curry was in office. There was the E. coli scare that fall. So our sales jumped oh. with the meat thing, then jumped again with the eggs. And it's what we needed. We needed a food scare to wake people up because I thought people think the food they're eating is fine. It's how I thought when I was 19. They think mm. it's fine. They trust it. They need to realize that the images they have of the Usborne farming books is not what's actually happening out there on conventional farms. And the food scares did that. So by the end of our first year, we did 1.2 million. So we opened. It was really slow. And then it took off. So that first year was like, we liken it to chasing a galloping horse or trying to stay on a galloping horse. We had no idea what we were doing. You know, the computer systems were complicated. The first day that we opened, we half of health and body care had plastic sheets on it because we hadn't loaded it up onto the computer, but we thought we have to open. You know, we kept delaying and delaying yeah. and delaying. And I had done this magical Mahurta, which was this kind of astrological opening date and time. So I thought, we're not missing it. <laughs> we're going to open oh it Oh my right. goodness. <laughs> oh, how fantastic. <laughs> so, and we had, you know, we always did a like a Chinese dragon ceremony for prosperity through the store and stuff. So I'm like, we're opening on time. And then the tills weren't working. So we had little boxes with coins in them. I mean, it was awful. It was so embarrassing. But that's where we were. And look where we are now. Look at me now, mom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your first year, as you said, you did 1.2 million. And your second year, you doubled revenues. You were becoming this sort of mecca in London for organic food. And it's just quite actually remarkable to think that you were the the first, the absolute first. It reminds me of this conversation because I would love to talk to you about this sort of emotional connection with your customers. And and, mm. and actually, we today go to supermarkets like zombies and just look at brands that we recognise and put them in our baskets and things like that. Greg Hoffman, who's the former CMO of Nike, said, if you want your brand to inspire loyalty and change the world, you need to create an emotional bond between consumers and product. Mm -hmm. And that if you get that right, you won't just have consumers, you will gain fans. And that's what I think must have happened. You know, you converted people over. And I talk about emotional commerce a lot because I think actually the entire world misses it yes. out there in business. But here you were connecting, you were talking to people about what you were putting in your mouth that you become and educating people. Was that really important to you? And it was obviously important, but did you see the value of that heart string connection? I didn't identify it, but it's how I'm built. I'm an emotional mm -hmm sensitive, thoughtful, aware person. And I really got that my life is a gift and I wanted to lead a life of service and service to mankind, service to the planet. And this was my service. So I was on the shop floor talking to customers. The bottom line is I care deeply, period. <laughs> Yeah, And that caring, however you define that or feel that, is powerful. It's palpable. People feel it. I care and I do things with care because I think we walk gently on the earth and leave the world a better place. That was always my understanding or belief for myself. So, of course, I would do business that way. And it's unconventional. And I knew I wouldn't fit into the corporate world. I mean, that was just never an option for me because I was honest and direct and emotional. And hmm. I think self-awareness has a lot to do with it. So when you say people, you know, the yeah. saying is, you are what you eat. And I think, no kidding. <laughs> people are like, wow, do you know you are what you eat? What else do you have? Does your body have to work with? You have the air that you breathe the things that you drink, and what you put in your body. So put in the best fuel, is what I always say. But I think it's a lot about self-awareness. And I think for me, self-awareness is the golden thread through everything that's important. Because when you're aware, you have choice. 
when you're walking unconsciously, when you're eating unconsciously, you're walking unconsciously through life, you're putting garbage in your mouth because you're not thinking about it. That is lack of awareness and self-awareness changes everything. Yes, I've never heard that. But it is true, actually. It's so true. And going back to what your mum said about bringing that feminine, well, owning femininity in business, do you think that those two things collided almost to create that confidence in yourself to be emotional, to care? Because, you know, I say to the list, they've heard this story before, I, you know, at Not On The High Street, I got to a stage where people would say, this business is just far, I'm talking about men, I'm talking about boards, I'm talking about those, you know, it's far too emotional. You know, it's so much emotion. Shut Everyone's up. just got so much emotion. And <laughs> as an insecure CEO, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to change this. Everyone's just got to get a grip here. You know, did a, now, now I'm like, of course it is. That's the golden, that's the thing you can't buy. Yeah. Aren't we lucky? You know, did you feel empowered to be female and emotional and make those connections did you or did you feel again like I was insecure I'm pretty sure of myself so I felt sure of who I am and it's interesting because the work I do now the course and I know we'll talk about this later is called be yourself and that is that's it be yourself because who else can you be and why else would you why would you be anyone else and I've met famous people, you know, we all have, and I treat everyone the same and I'm always the same because it just, it's weird to think of doing that differently. How could I, yeah. how could I be anyone else? And that's just But character. a lot of us do try, but people listening might say, but I don't know, especially women, I would say, you know, there's all that, the chat is imposter syndrome isn't it it's that is something we have these labels I can sort that out we feel it you know we feel insecure don't we we don't you know all those yeah. sorts of things so when you were building but it's just wrong thinking and that's easy to unpick with a good coach or mentor mm -hmm. you know that is just it's just a thought it's a not good thought as Mo Gordet would say can I have another one yeah absolutely and if you practice meditation at all Meditation is about seeing the thoughts come, going back to the breath, letting the thoughts go, because you're not attaching meaning to the thoughts, because your thinking mind isn't where you want to be. You want to be in your awareness. And then meditation becomes about taking that practice into waking consciousness. So you have a negative thought, you see it objectively as a thought, and that awareness gives you choice to not respond as a small person or in your littleness, but to discard that thought and be in your magnitude. Yes. Did you have that brilliance when you were building those first few years? Were you able yes, to... Yes, I got that in the six-month program. That course changed my life and changed made me, your life. I knew that I could do anything. Gave you the foundations, it seems. I want to go to a place where you would need those foundations mm -hmm. because it seems like everything was going well. Business is booming. Your London sort of mecca for all things organic, as I said. But then there was this very difficult legal situation that was brewing with your former business partner. And I know this is something that really took over your world. And as I said, I, I'm sure that you sort of had to pulled the strength from that course that you did. Might you share a little bit more with what happened? Sure. So as you said, we doubled our turnover to 2.4 the second year. And the third year, we actually did 3.6. So we were the mecca. Everyone, we were pulling in from too wide an area across London. The business was successful. And I love working in partnership, but there are always issues with partners. You know, you've got to have good communication. You've got to tell the truth. And my partner, who I started Planet with, came in a meeting. It, I don't need to go into the detail, but he said he was struggling. He thought he should have the business for himself. So he said to me, I'll buy your shares and you can go. And I was like, what? Because I, at that time, had decided that I didn't want children. So Planet was my baby and I called Planet my baby. 
So when he said that, I was like, what? If, if you're not happy, you go. But that was so naive, and I still am naive. And I'm a small-town girl, and he's from a very moneyed, powerful, well-connected family. So I was like, I'm not going. And then he said, well, if you don't go, I'll sue you. And I said, on what grounds? So he went to a lawyer and brought charges against me. I went to my lawyer and said, what on earth do I do? And I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but my remedy really was to counter sue because by the suit he was bringing against me, he was creating a case for me. So, Gosh. but the reality, the thing that was important that that is important to talk about is it was such a common story. Guy and a girl start a business, girl gets pushed mm -hmm. out, or two people start a business, one gets pushed out. What do you do? And we were in litigation for 14 months, and then we had an 11-day trial in the high court. Now, if I had lost, I would have been bankrupted, and I would have had to start again. And there was, on that journey, it was exhausting and terrifying because they tried to intimidate me out of the business and make pre-trials that were expensive because he knew I didn't have any money. I'd put mm -hmm. everything into Planet and I'd borrowed money from my parents as well. I heard you had to remortgage your house. Yes. Yeah, the house in East Twickenham. Yeah. But I thought when it first started, I thought nobody messes with, my my maiden name is Jurgalon. So I'm like, nobody messes with Jurgalon. I'm going to stand up. You know, it's it's David and Goliath. And then by the summer, so this started in November. By the summer, I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I was in the amygdala the whole time. I was in fight, flight, freeze, which is so destructive in your body. Mm. So what I did, and the most important lesson I learned at that time was take care of self first. So I ate even better than I had been. I went to the gym. I meditated for an hour in the morning and an hour at night. I slept. I stopped drinking. If there was any slightly negative person in my life at that point, they were out. <laughs> I surrounded myself yeah. with people who were supportive and cared for me. I closed ranks, pretty much. I closed ranks to conserve energy so that I could fight. I read the Bhagavad Gita. I read Sun Tzu's Art of War, the core message of which is know thy enemy, which I did. And I prepared because I thought, I'm a good student. I'm a straight-A student. I can do this. Yes. But I hit a point in the summer where I was like, we'd taken out the second mortgage. We'd run out of money for legal fees. Because when I went to the lawyers, I said, how much is this going to cost? And they said, well, 50,000, 60,000 pounds. My legal bill was 560,000 pounds. But in oh England, my goodness. Yeah, loser pays in England. So he picked up my bill. But I would have been wiped out. So in the summer, I thought, I don't know if I can do this. And people were giving me advice, which I really try not to ever do. But I said to a girlfriend, come away with me. I need to get away. I need to get to my truth because I can't even hear my inner, that small, still voice that is my truth. So we went to the Lake District and we walked in the hills. And at the end of the weekend, I'm like, okay, where's my message? Where's my sign for the universe? <laughs> what do I do? Nothing came. And then we were sitting by this lake and the little waves were coming at us. And I thought, okay, I'm going to imagine quitting now. Yeah, they kept offering me money for my shares. I take the money, I go, I start up again. And I'm going to imagine staying and fighting. And I thought, if I quit, I'll never know if I could have won. If I stay and fight, I will accept what happens with grace and dignity because I trust in the unfolding of life. I trust in the process, but I can't walk away. I can't quit. So I decided to stay and fight. We had this 11-day trial in the high courts. I won my case against my partner. He lost his case against me. Three things had to happen, those two things. And then the judge ordered in my favor, which was I got to buy my partner's shares which, of course, I didn't have the money to do, but I had to bring in shareholders at that time. So it was complicated and exhausting. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Sounds like a Hollywood movie or something. Yeah, it would make a great movie. My... <laughs> Wouldn't it? I was a straight A student, so I said, don't mess with me. I am coming after you. And this is the thing, isn't it? These sort of stories, I think, aren't told enough. Yeah. The absolute, you know, I've had my own experience, not the same, but of that sort of magnitude where I was on the floor, on the floor, raging against 
business, people trying to take advantage, mm-hmm. taking yeah. things away, wanting to take what you'd built. And because we've put so much of ourselves, yes. our DNA in that business, it's like you're ripping out, you know, something out of Harry Potter. You know, you're being, your soul's being sucked out. Yes. You know, this yeah. is, so that's, <laughs> is that the shadow side, isn't it? It's the shadow side of the gloriousness of what we can build with ourselves. Yes. But if anyone tries to take it away, yeah. It's not just a business. No. You know, this is my calling. It's what I'm leaving with the world. How did you come out of it? Were you raring to go? You'd won? No. In your Hollywood scene, what would happen? No. Would you be running down the street? <laughs> yeah. No. So the other thing I want to say about that, though, and the interesting thing is because people, it happens in business. And I've actually coached some of my clients through situations like that. And the thing is, The thing to remember is, one, the universe only throws at you what you can cope with, I believe. And Mm -hmm. two, you'll always be okay. Everything will always be okay. It always is. And you cannot control what happens to you in life. The only thing you can control is how you respond. So you can cry and weep and wail and gnash your teeth and feel sorry for yourself. But I never let that happen. So when this started, I remember thinking, this is not a pity party. I'm not going to say, oh, why me? Why is this happening? Nope. It's happening. Stuff happens. The question is, how am I going to deal with it? And I decided to fight. And I also decided that my MO through that would be grace and dignity, which I mentioned a minute ago, because it's easy to get down and dirty in that kind of situation. And they did. And I thought, at the end of this, win or lose, how do I want to feel about who I was through this Mm. process? And I often say to clients, who do you want to be through this particular situation or scenario? Because that's your agency. That's where you have agency. Who you are. Do you maintain your integrity and your grace? Or do you slide into ugly or pity? Not great. Mm. We can control that. That's the thing that we can control. Tell me, before we get on to your second business, you came out of that and just tell me the, yes, the halo I didn't of what tell happened. You that. So I came out, for, I came out of the, the judgment in shock. And I had, okay, this was the days where I had a mobile phone, but you didn't use it for long distance calls. So I had like all these pound coins in my pocket. I came out of the courtroom and filled the pay phone outside of the courtroom and woke my parents up and said, I won. And I was trying not to be loud because his family was trooping out behind me and I didn't want to be, you know, (laughs) unpleasant. But I was like, I won, I won. And I was crying. And so we went out and had a wonderful dinner with our lawyer and our barrister who were just amazing, our litigator. And then I had said to my husband, if I win, I can't do this on my own because I was, I was very exhausted. And I said, would you come and work with me? Because I'd always wanted to work with him anyway. So he had quit his job three months before because he had three months notice and said, it's a crapshoot, but we'll see. I'll either work with you or I'll try and go back to my job. <laughs> <laughs> so we started working together. But I felt so sad and kind of heartbroken that this glorious idea had fallen apart, that it took me a while to recover from that emotionally. Mm. And physically, I was worn out. So I actually had gone down on the shop floor because I was getting headaches. I was very, it had been so stressful for so long, even though I'd taken really good care of myself. Mm. And there was this naturopath on the shop floor, Max Tomlinson, who came in, he'd come in and talk to customers and help. And he's, I went down to the girls on the shop floor and I said, I've got a headache. What can you give me? And Max was there and he said, oh, I can help. And I have to say, he's gorgeous. He's like a, an Adonis, blonde hair, blue eyes. He takes my, he said, I do pulse analysis, takes my hand in his hand, starts reading my pulse, looks into my eyes, says I do iridology. And I'm thinking, I love my husband. I love my husband. <laughs> 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 oh my God. And he said, what happened to you? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the stress in your eyes is the stress of a fighter pilot. So I told him in a few sentences about the trial and started to cry. And he said, 
get this, he said, I will treat you for free until you're better because of what you've given our community with Planet Organic. And he got me back on my feet. Oh, I feel like, isn't that amazing that your idea attracted hearts and souls like that person and that all customers could feel it, what you created, the people in there, what they believed in. Again, it goes to the importance of the values that we put in our business and how powerful this can be to those who work there what message they're then spreading. It's incredible. As you know, I'm passionate about celebrating small businesses and championing creativity within all of us. That's why I'm thrilled to be working with Adobe Express, who each week are handing over their ad break to a small business founder, shining a light on their own businesses and sharing how Adobe Express really is helping fuel their creativity. Hello, I'm Carrie. And I'm Sarah from Happy Dashery. Happy Dashery is a little shop on Leighton Buzzard High Street that is full of little bits of happy. Thoughtful gifts, homewares, accessories, jewellery and beautifully curated gifts from around the UK. We run workshops in the evenings and daytimes and this can range from all things macrame, plant hangers and mirrors through to jasmineite pots and coasters and even crochet. And what we like to do through these workshops is try and build a community which is fun, exciting, different. So sometimes we don't have the time to promote via Instagram and Facebook and this is where we have found Adobe Express to be really useful. Adobe Express is one of those platforms which for us as a small business has just been so useful. It's been a bit of a game changer, to be honest with you. We have templates that we've adapted so that they contain our own brand colours, our logo, and it's just a really easy way to help us get our message across. And it gives us that ability to get something that's really good quality out quickly to our customers. So our Instagram is at Happy Dashery and our website is happydashery.co.uk. Thank you once more to Adobe, who have helped to make this podcast episode happen. If you want to find out more about Adobe Express and how it can help your business, head over to adobe.com slash go slash Holly Tucker. Now let's get back to our conversation of inspiration. Tell me what a wise one that I literally feel like I'm having some sort of meditation therapy session here. It's just the best thing ever. Beluga bean. Yes. This hard won wisdom, you decided to share it. Tell me about this. Well, it's been such an interesting journey. And there have been times along the way, especially when I was in the litigation where I thought, why is this happening? Not, why is this happening? But hmm, I'll understand this in the future. And when I look back, I can see such a clear path leading in my life. I started Planet because I believe in well-being. And I believe physical well-being is the foundation, is the cornerstone of that. But I believe in well-being across six spheres. And I figured that out at 19, which funnily enough is the reason I decided not to have children. Because I thought, I cannot take responsibility for their well-being in all of those areas, I'll be a nervous wreck. A sidebar, I did have three children, ultimately, and I was a nervous wreck, but it's okay now. <laughs> are all so, their six spheres perfect? They are by any amazing. Chance? They're the most, I could tell you stories that would make you cry. Yes. <laughs> cry oh, in a good way. Brilliant. Yeah. Amazing kids, amazing relationship. Teenage years don't have to be difficult. They've been beautiful. So it all depends on your relationship. Mm. So I set Planet up. I always said, I'm going to do this work for the rest of my life. And I really believed that. But then I had other things going on with shareholders. And then I had three children. And it was time for me to step out, which I never thought I would do. So then I thought, what now? And I remember sitting at one point on the sofa talking to Brian. And I said, but I was going to do this forever. You know, what on earth am I supposed to do now? And I was about I was early 50s. And he said, maybe Planet was just a stepping stone to the real work that you're doing. Wow. And I was like, oh, oh, I never thought of that. And what's interesting is what I realized through working at Planet was 
the most important thing is purpose and being yourself and self-awareness. And that really is what I do now in Beluga Bean. So Beluga Bean, it's really about the course that we teach, which is called Be Yourself. And my partner, Sam Wigan and I started working together in 2017, and we developed this. He's had like 25 years of personal development work, and I had this work that I started at the beginning. But it's a journey of self-awareness. It's personal transformation over a year, and it's a year of support and transformation. And it's based on the idea that you know yourself, you then can be yourself, and then how to manage yourself. And to know yourself, because a lot of people say, I don't know if I know myself. I want to know myself. So there's a framework. We've created a framework to know yourself. And it's based on well-being and awareness. Because if you have well-being in all of those areas, or wellness or success or whatever you want to call it, then your life is like 100% life. And the spheres are, because when you say well-being, people think physical, emotional, yeah, or psychological. Mm -hmm. It's physical, which is move, fuel, rest. It's three areas. Then it's occupational, psychological, economic, social, and spiritual. And that is everything in your world. So we have a framework where we dive into that so that you can learn about yourself and know yourself. Then it's be yourself. And then manage yourself is tools to keep on track with all of those spheres of well-being so that you're at your optimum all the time and can prioritize what's the most important. And also manage yourself through self-awareness. And the golden thread through the course is self-awareness because that awareness enables choice and choice gives you freedom. So I also, I do a kind of three-year program where I teach BOSS, which is business owner support and strategy. And it's for entrepreneurs, either new or pivoting or struggling And it's strategy and business planning, which I love. And I frame in a completely different way because people say, I hate the business plan. And I say, not my business plan. You haven't heard about that. (laughs) And the other half, the other 50% is personal development. So it's the self-esteem, the imposter syndrome. It's unpicking those Mm. things, which are not difficult to unpick, I think, so Mm. that you are at your most powerful, that you're operating in your magnitude. And if you slip, you know what to do. So there's boss and then there's be yourself. And I do be yourself with my entrepreneurs. My joy is doing that with couples because when you take that journey of self-awareness with your partner, oh, it's magic. I've had miracles happen. It's the work. This is the work of the heart. This is, it's like eating candy, which of course I don't do, <laughs> but I have a reference for that from when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and then Sam and I deliver Be Yourself in corporate leadership teams, because if you, it's about leadership, it's about being at your best, it's about understanding yourself, knowing how to manage yourself. It's absolutely beautiful. It's just so beautiful to listen to you as well. That course you did with your husband before Planet Organic, it's like you've come completely full circle. Yes, it it had such a transformational effect on you and opened you up to the universe and what you then built. Yes. And then you're now giving, it's like you're it's sharing giving that. it, sharing that with everybody. Absolutely. And if I had had help on the strategy plus the self-awareness when I was running Planet, I was crazy. It was so crazy. If I'd had that support, it would have transformed my experience of Planet Organic because Planet Organic was a freaking roller coaster. It was mm. highs and lows and highs and lows. And and this smooths that out. It really puts you in the driver's seat. So for me, it's about taking that journey with entrepreneurs because I love the entrepreneurial journey. I don't want to do that again. Now my life is about ease and joy, but to do it with entrepreneurs is phenomenal. Couples, women, men. I wish in hindsight, this is the wonderful thing, isn't it? I started not in the high street at 28 and with no experience and with every thing almost against and uh, the highs and lows and why actually at the end, I'm going to ask you about your roller coaster moments right because that's what it is it's just a complete roller coaster and I do look now back and think the more self-assured Holly that I am today I wish I wish 
I had been able to be that person then because it would have just all been different. And I think this is what you're doing here with Beluga Bean is you're sort of giving entrepreneurs the plasters before they need it and able to just not have some of the experiences that we did. If you had to think, we're coming to the end of this podcast, but if there was some advice that you might share with women in business today, what would it be? Oh, yes. So I think the most important thing is trust yourself. Know that you have your own best answers all the time. You know what's best for you, for your business, for your children if you have them. And yes, canvas the opinions of other people, but nobody has authority over your life. You choose, you know, go inside yourself and find your answers. A lot of people want to tell you what to do or give you advice. Listen politely and then do what you think is best. Mm, Great advice for us women who self-doubt everything. You know that we don't, we, we just always think that there must be someone else that might know better. Yeah. We think, oh, they're an expert. I work with clients who've said- The silver bullet, I call them. Yeah. They say, I don't love my branding, but we were at this agency and they're obviously the experts. And I say, no, you know your brand. You, they should be pulling it out of you. You pull it out of yourself. You know what's best all the time. All the time. I could literally, as I said, I, I, I came onto this podcast in one mood and I'm leaving this podcast in a completely better mood. I have felt like I've Yay. just sucked in <laughs> organic goodness from you. Hello. Tell me, you. if we have used the roller coaster as an analogy, which you obviously have had your time on, and obviously you and your roller coaster, it would be very zen-like. You'd have your six spheres all sorted in your cart. What would you say was your lowest moment in your career? I would say when my partner told me he was going to take me to court to take the business away. Did he blindside you? Did you know this was even coming? We were having some difficulties, but I really believe that you can work anything out through communication. Mm. So I was like, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And the worst thing that he did, I think this was, I realized the seriousness of this was after he said that to me the next day, we went into the office and we shared a tiny office, did only have room for our two desks. He refused to speak to me. And I thought, oh, my God, it's over. How pathetic. So that was the, then I realized it was, and I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if I was going to end up with Planet Organic or not. Conversely, the greatest high that you would say? Uh, It sounds funny. I think some people will laugh or roll their eyes, but you have to remember I'm a small town American girl and twice The Queen invited me to Buckingham Palace to celebrate me. I'd say honor me, but it wasn't an official honor, but it was she invited women in business and American women to celebrate us. And I felt celebrated for my achievement at Planet. And it was like the highest, because when you're an entrepreneur, no one pats you on the back. And this was like the highest (laughs) congratulations I had received. Although we also received an award from Prince Charles for West One Grove. But it was those moments when someone said, you know, well done, Renee. And you have to learn to pat yourself on the back. But for me, that was like, oh, my God, I'm a small town girl. I'm at the palace. I met the queen. How wonderful. What a wonderful memory. Renee, this has been incredible, but it is that time of the podcast where I know you've prepared a letter to your younger self. I don't know what you're going to read. It's time that I take my glasses off and uh, listen to you sharing a little bit of your soul with us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And what's funny is I've obviously referenced some of these things because I, I can't tell my story without these popping up. So Little repetition, but they say learning is repetition. So, dear you, hi, beautiful. I've been given the gift of writing to you. Some of this you figured out already or will figure out anyway. But here are 10 truths that will save you time. One, you are enough. This is the most important thing you need to know. Most of the world believe they aren't enough. They compare themselves with others, and they look outside themselves for happiness and anything to make them feel enough. 
but you are enough as you are. Go within. Be you. You are enough because you are energy. You are a being of light. You are everything you want to be. Your true self at your core is perfect. You are part of the earth, part of nature, which only and always creates perfection. Consider a tree or a butterfly. So feel the sacredness within you. Free the goddess within you. You can do anything you want to do. Two, follow the sacred triangle of relationships. That is, trust yourself, respect yourself, and be in good communication with yourself. Trust, respect, and good calm. For example, when your body tells you it's tired, then stop and rest. Hear the communication. Trust yourself and respect your body by stopping. Your body is the most precious gift you have while you live on this earth. Feed it the best food, keep it moving and fit, and let it rest. Practice the sacred triangle in all of your important relationships at work and at home. Three, trust your small, still voice. That is your inner knowing, your intuition, your heart. You will always know what is best for you, your life, your work, your family. Trust your heart and don't allow anyone to direct your life. Take care of self first. Nurture the six areas of your well-being, physical, occupational, psychological, economic, social, and spiritual. Your well-being affects everyone you know and everything you do. When you take care of yourself first, you can then truly and sustainably show up for everything else and everyone else in your life. Five, self-awareness enables choice. Awareness of your thoughts, reactions, charge, emotion, gives you the choice to respond differently. Awareness enables you to see that the negativity is in your head and frees you from it. Awareness frees you from being at the effect of your thoughts and emotions and at the effect of others. Six, practice objectivity with your thoughts. A thought is not a fact. I'll say it again. A thought is not a fact. And if you grip a thought, if you stew over something someone says or something going on, it becomes a thought form or an emotion and can take over and paralyze you with its power. See a thought as just a thought. Become aware of thoughts and simply let them be. Learn to drop thoughts instead of gripping them. Seven, in life there is suffering. It is important you understand this because you need to know how not to suffer. Emotional suffering is because the world isn't as you want it to be or think it should be. And when people suffer, they either run away, escape, deny, or suppress. So here's how not to suffer. One, awareness. Self-awareness gives you choice. Two, accept things as they are, not as you want them to be. Three, doing this will make you less tense, less afraid, and create openness. Four, then instead of reacting, you respond. Five, take responsibility for your part in what's going on. And six, see what possibility opens up, because now you are in awareness and openness, and look for the solution. Please use this process to reduce or eliminate the suffering in your life. Eight, everything is perfect. Life unfolds as it should. Reach for this when you need reassurance. Trust there is a greater intelligence at work. No matter what happens, know that everything will be okay. The universe only throws at you that which you can handle. And remember, you can't control what happens in your life. Your agency lies in how you respond. Nine, laugh and have fun. If it's not fun, it's probably not worth doing because life is the day-to-day -day journey. 10, you are loved. Another way to say all of this is know yourself, forgive yourself, trust yourself, respect yourself, put yourself first, direct yourself, manage yourself, love yourself, and truly be yourself. I will write again, take care of you, I love you, me.
I think everyone is just taking a big breath there. Totally beautiful. Totally beautiful. It feels like I've just pressed an app on my phone and it's called Calm. (laughs) And your voice has just come out of it with that letter. It is absolutely, I am going to play it over and over again and take in what you've shared with us today because that was was incredibly special. I've never done that before. You are a very special lady. And I know, well, I know you know that, but we have been blessed with you today. Thank you for sharing such vulnerability with us and for showing us women entrepreneurs how it's done. Um, We'll be internally grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before you go, don't forget to head to adobe.com slash go slash Holly Tucker to find out how Adobe Express can fuel creativity in your business. And if you've enjoyed this episode, if it's helped you along your journey or inspired you, would you mind rating and reviewing? Your support means the world to me. It really does spread the word and will help inspire even more people to build a life they love. And if you want to hear all our latest news, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter, Holly's Desk Notes, over at holly.co. 